And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, we have the next uh, keynote address by Dr. Ambrish Mithil, Chairman and Head Diabetes Division, Medanta Medicity. His uh, talk is going to be on diabetes in India, the rising epidemic. Just to uh, introduce him, uh, he's uh, presently, as I said, uh, the Chairman and Head of Endocrinology and Diabetes Division at Medanta, the Medicity, where he has established one of India's premier diabetes and endocrinology centers. Dr. Mithil was the first DM in endocrinology from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and subsequently served on the faculty at the Sanjay Gandhi PGI Lucknow from uh, 1988 to 1998, where he was instrumental in setting up the Department of Endocrinology. He also served as a senior consultant endocrinology and diabetes at the Indraprastha Apollo Hospitals, New Delhi from 98 to 2009. He is uh, Editor-in-Chief of the Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism, past President of the Endocrine Society of India. He is a board member of the International Osteoporosis Foundation and his current areas of research interest include vitamin D nutrition in Indians, gestational diabetes, diabetes and the heart and the new therapies for diabetes. I invite Dr. Amrish Mittal for uh, his keynote address. Thank you for inviting me here. So Anup has very uh, neatly tried to uh, explain some very complex concepts uh, in a lucid manner. Uh, what I'll be doing is really, as you already said, uh, talk about boring numbers. And let's try and see if we can make the numbers a little bit interesting. Uh, Anup and I have been uh, debating since class 8 or 9, I think, maybe sometimes on the same side, sometimes on the opposite side, but never at a loss for words. So today I'll be talking to you about uh, the rising epidemic, that is diabetes in India, already highlighted various mechanisms which could be responsible for that. But what exactly are the numbers? Are they changing? Are we really that seriously affected as people make out as just media hype? What really is happening in India? How does this work? Something wrong? Yeah, now moved. Where should I point it? Can I go back? Okay. So we all know about uh, India being the, I hate that word, but the diabetes capital, so-called diabetes capital of the world. And we also know it's not just India, it's, it's India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. We are kind of, South Asia is kind of facing the brunt of the diabetes epidemic for a variety of reasons, some of which have already been elucidated. And these are examples of international magazines and national leading magazines, which consider it important enough to put diabetes on the cover, as similarly, I mean, as Economic Times is doing today, uh, talking about diabetes. Why talk about a disease in front of so many experts and so much media? And the reason is that diabetes is big in this, in this part of the world, not in a good sense. We know that non-communicable disease is a go global crisis. We know very well that, that, sorry, overall deaths, are really happening largely because of non-communicable disease in the world. And you look at this slide, these are different income ranges. Maybe I should come here. These are different income ranges of countries. And if you look at this, to the left are the high income group companies, and to the extreme right are the low income group companies. And the bars, the, the orange bars, are non-communicable diseases. So if you look at that, the, as, you, as countries develop, the proportion of people getting non-communicable disease becomes higher. So when you're lower down, when you're low income group, then communicable nutritional disorders, that is a middle bar to the right side of your slide, is actually dominant. But as you move towards the left, you will find 
that is an NCDs that really dominate us. So India is sort of caught in a cleft. We still have a big bar of communicable disorders. We have a big bar of nutrition. And yet we also have an increasing prevalence of NCDs, which is a real challenge. They are also the single biggest cause of death worldwide, non-communicable disease. You know, as, as economies evolve, as countries develop, NCDs, people live longer, lifestyles change, NCDs dominate, unfortunately. So if you're able to get rid of infections where many westernized Western countries have, Northern Europe, United States, Canada, where bacterial infections are not a common cause of death. Uh, malnutrition is not an important cause of morbidity or mortality. Non-communicable disease like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, cancer, they become the leading causes. And as you can see, a single biggest, the single biggest cause of death is these non-communicable diseases put together. So just to again say, communicable disease, nutritional disease. Communicable disease means infections. Nutrition means poor nutrition, could be protein nutrition, could be micronutrition, anything. Communicable disease, non-communicable disease means that is not spread from person to person, which means disorders which are metabolic, genetic, lifestyle related, environmental. And there is a huge economic impact. I won't really go into that except the middle part here, which shows that non-communicable disease, NCDs, cost developing countries up to 6.77% of GDP. Uh, Anup was showing you the Bloomberg report. I mean, in pure economic terms, it is huge. Imagine the, 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 the cost of managing NCDs for a country like India. It is unimaginable, actually. And you really cannot see a situation where India will reach a level where we'll be able to manage actually diabetes, for example, and its related complications. The economic burden will be too much. So the answer has to be in prevention. Just management of these conditions is going to be soon, already is, but will soon be beyond the scope of a country like ours. This is some Indian data, but I think I'll not I'll not bore you with this kind of data, basically again showing that the burden of disease in the top half and the causes of death in the bottom half, really the burden of disease is shifting in India. In terms of numbers, communicable disease has not gone down that much. In terms of numbers, childhood malnutrition is still huge and the numbers of NCDs have been added. So as a proportion, non-communicable disease is increasing both in terms of burden of disease, you can see the the, the brown part in the, in the top half, 1998 to 2005, and 2005 and 2025 forecast. We're getting increasing number of people in this group. And the cost to society, according to the IDF, International Diabetes Federation, are high and escalating. The, the number of people who are affected is huge. Globally, seven Every seven seconds, someone actually, this is, these are morbid figures really, but globally every seven seconds, one person may actually be dying because of diabetes or associated complications. Why do we emphasize that? Diabetes is not just high blood glucose. Diabetes means various organs could fail. It means the kidneys could fail. It means the eyes could go haywire. It means the heart could fail. Two thirds of deaths in diabetes are because of cardiac issues. So it doesn't mean that diabetes, people are dying of blood glucose. It means they're dying of complications or the sequelae of diabetes, diabetes itself. And it really makes a difference in all, all sections of society. And as, as was again shown in that report, if you study migrants to, to, to cities in India, you will find a huge prevalence of diabetes. I'm sure if someone did a study on, on, on people who drive our cars, the drivers, the chauffeurs, who have migrated usually from small towns in UP, Bihar, Haryana, wherever, and are now in a completely sedentary job. Their risks of at least, at least 20 of my friend's uh, drivers I'm treating for, for diabetes. So it is, it is really big. It cuts across all, so it's not a disease of the rich as was thought originally. It, it's not like that. And obviously, one out of nine dollars of healthcare is spent on diabetes worldwide. And Southeast Asia, now these figures were fairly recent. Southeast Asia as a whole, 75 million people living with diabetes. Now those numbers are staggering, but they are a gross underestimate. Actually, India alone may have 
65 million and probably that's an under, underestimate too. So we are looking at huge, huge number, 65 millions in our common parlance, six and a half crores, right, of people. And that we think may be an underestimate. Because if you look at some of the newer data I'm going to show, it's pretty shocking where we are heading. So we really need to, need to work on that. Again, from the IDF figures, 72 million, 75 million, those numbers stop making sense after some time because they are so high in, in, in Southeast Asia. Out of 382 million in the world, so we're already right up there, one-fifth maybe, and out of which 65 million uh, according to estimates in India. But this is important of trends in diabetes prevalence, and I think this review was done by Anoop, if I'm not wrong. Uh, our mentor, Professor Ahuja of Ames, did the first serious study in 1972 uh, of diabetes prevalence. Professor Vinod Kumar must have been there, and, and really showed that the prevalence was 2.3% in urban Delhi, and uh, it was significantly lower, about a percent in rural population. So 2.3% in 1972, and in 1991, 6.7%. And now I'm going to come to 2015, and you'll see where we're heading. Right. So these are not hospital-based registries. They are not hospital-based data. They are actually community-based studies, supposedly representative of the population. Maybe a little bit off, but by and large, yes. Now, but this is important, and this is slightly complex, and I'm a little blurred also. But if you look at this, this is the urban increase and the, the black dots, and the and this open squares are the rural increase. So while there is increase in urban is exponential, the top line. If you see the top line, you see there's a rapid increase in urban prevalence of diabetes from 1955 or wherever you had the data first to 2005. It's a steep curve, rapidly increasing, not just the numbers. This is proportion of people affected. And you realize that the numbers are also increasing, our population is increasing hugely. And the bottom line is the rural. So it's not just urban. Rural parts of India are also seeing an increase in diabetes. It's not this at the same rate as an urban population, but it's nevertheless there. And some pioneering studies from, from Chennai, which actually showed rising prevalence of diabetes in urban India. And look at these figures. These are not, again, we're not going back to the 70s or 60s. You just look at 1995 and 2008. Look at those bars there. 11.6 to 18.6%. So, I mean, there is 18.6% of adult population being diabetic over 14 I mean, over 14 years, the prevalence increased by 72.3%. So you're actually looking at 18.6% of the adult population being diabetic. And there's still more to follow. Why is this happening? This is, of course, the genes are the same. If it was all in the genes, you wouldn't really be getting an increase. We are all the same people. But as our lifestyles are changing, the socio-demographic nutritional transition that is happening, you will see that there is a lot of sedentary lifestyle, things that were normal activities for when you live in a village, you know, just going to the water or even if you go backwards, going to the fields, going uh, to get your water, going for your food, everything involves some physical activity. Now we are struggling to take out time for any activity because everything has become automated. And this is a good example of how people in cities are spending their time, TV serials, rocking chair, and snacking all the time. It's also about huge numbers. This is not the scene in India's villages. This is seen in India's cities. The stress, the commute, you know, eating fast food naturally comes there. And of course, we love to blast uh, Western fast food, which is correctly, which is correct. I mean, talking of McDonald's and others is 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 completely acceptable and rightly so. That they have also added to our problems. But we forget. We don't like to talk about Indian fast food. Uh, uh, Anup was telling you about boiling the oil 36 times. And what is the product from that? Probably the most delicious snack in the world if prepared properly. And unfortunately, one of the unhealthiest, if, especially if the oil is reboiled. So Indian fast food, whether it's, if you're saying McDonald's, I can say Haldi Ram and Nathu's also. If that's allowed, this is also allowed, are equally bad. See the cues. In, uh, for, for chart outside Delhi, uh, you know, uh, uh, any area of Delhi, where there's a chart shop in the corner. 
See the queues in Nathus and Aldirams. I know when I was working in Apollo, they, they had opened a, uh, many years ago, they had opened a health food stall. I think it's still there. Compare the crowds there versus the crowds at the Nathus or Aldirams that is there. So there is a problem in our food and you can't just blame it on McDonald's and Pepsi alone. It is easy access to food that is causing it. Easy access to supposedly uh, tasty food, you know, and, and people get busy, no time to cook, and this is how it happens. Now, the ICMR in diab study, which looked at the prevalence of diabetes and pre-diabetes, this is an ICMR study, Indian Council for Medical Research, and looked at Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra. Look at the numbers again. 13.7, 10.9 in Maharashtra. These are not just small, uh, big cities. These are small and medium-sized cities also. Jharkhand. So the first thing is, in urban uh, areas, it's, it's really almost similar everywhere. So you know, whether it's 15% or 16% makes no difference, but the fact is it's, it's huge. And in rural areas also, it is progressively increasing. And perhaps the more rural the area, the less the diabetes. Jharkhand rural areas are still 3%. But as you move differently, Maharashtra overall slightly lower, maybe because of eating habits, often less body weight in, in Maharashtrians. So you, there may be differences there that are worth looking at. But overall, pretty disturbing figures. And based on this were these figures that came out 63 million or now 65 million or whatever. And pre-diabetes, 77 million. So, so that makes it, if you talk of dysglycemia, which means either frank diabetes or pre-diabetes is stage before diabetes, not always transiting to diabetes, but often transiting to diabetes, you will find, you're not talking of six and a half crores, talking 15 crores. I mean, that is, that is really disturbing, right? So, and if you look at the age-wise prevalence, so this is all adults, right? Look at the age-wise prevalence, which, which is incredible. Just look at this urban and rural. The blue lines are urban. So look at the age-wise prevalence, 45 to 54. 55 plus, where are those figures? 30%. Can you see that? Let's just look at uh, anyone. Let's look at Tamil Nadu. Can you see Tamil Nadu there? The left upper. Look at that and see where the figures go. As the age increases, if you're looking at the last 55 plus and urban, where is the figure? It's close to 40%. It's completely crazy. And these are again not hospital based figures. Right? Jharkhand. 35%, Chandigarh, 35 So there may be some anomalies in these studies. I'm not saying these studies are perfect. There may be some debate, discussions about sampling, but you can't shut your eyes. It is very, very striking. And in rural, uh, Tamil Nadu, Jharkhand, Chandigarh, and Maharashtra also. And you see Chandigarh has a, maybe the, the eating habits in rural and urban are not very different. So you see somewhat parallel increase. Where the rural urban disparity is more, you will find more disparity in diabetes also. And this is the uh, two other studies I'm going to present. One is just to explain uh, the basics. The, this is the, the, the cardiometabolic risk reduction in South Asia study, the surveillance for that, large cohort model surveillance study in South Asia, more than 10,000 individuals from randomly, randomly chosen uh, communities of Delhi and Chennai. Right? And there's Karachi also in this. I've cut that out. There are three cities, Delhi, Chennai, and Karachi. Karachi showed similar figures. So however hard you would try to be different, you're actually exactly the same as, as Pakistan in terms of your risks and everything else. Okay? So more than 20 years. And if you look at that, look at these numbers. We're talking of 15%, 16%. This is 2015, just published. Right? Look at the figures there. We are straight away at 20%. Straight away at 20%. I think this is, these are staggering figures. And, you know, uh, people like, uh, like uh, some of us who have been struggling in this field for the last 15 years, 20 years, I mean, these are, this, is a, this is really disappointing and depressing, actually. But, you know, one has to just go on. Uh, the, look at the age-wise prevalence in the CAR study. Right. This is diabetes, and whether you call it pre-diabetes. Pre-diabetes means... If your fasting glucose is above 100 and below 126, or your postprandial post glucose is between 140 and 200, that is pre-diabetes. So you're not really reached diabetes, but you're at a high risk. And before I say that, I will also say that there are some studies from India which suggest that a conversion from pre-diabetes to diabetes may be also uh, faster. 
unlike the West. So it's not that our pre-diabetics are going to remain pre-diabetics. Many of them are going to convert and fast. Okay. So if you look at that, I think this, these figures are actually very, very disturbing. Look at Delhi. Delhi and Chennai, we're looking at age <coughs> less than 24. So 20 to 24, first group. Then 25 to 34, it goes on like that. Look at, 50, look at just Delhi first. At 55 to 64, or above 65, 36%, 35% diabetic of community. Right? Even at 25 to 34, 4% are diabetic, and 35 to 44, 10%. 35 to 44, age group 10%, 11% people are diabetic in Delhi. What about Chennai? Some differences, but broadly following the same pattern. But above 65, 45%. So almost half the people in Chennai will actually be diabetic, no, not pre-diabetic. And let's look at, to further drive this point home, let's look at the pre-diabetes part. And look at the pre-diabetes here. The, if you add these, the numbers become like mind-boggling. Okay? If you look at pre-diabetes, 5, 15, as the age goes up, the pre-diabetes then, of course, stabilizes because most of them convert to diabetes. It doesn't keep going up with, with, with each decade, as diabetes does. And look at Delhi there. Look at 42, 41% pre-diabetes in, in mid, I mean, 35 to 44, 45 to 54 age group. So this is like a big shocker. According to this study, 70%. Uh, so you can actually divide your adults into three parts. How many of us are there in this room? How many? Maybe 80, 100 people? Yeah. So maybe, let's say there are 100 people in the room. So, and they're all adults. So I would say maybe 30 are diabetic. Another 30 are pre-diabetic. So if you do a proper glucose tolerance test, you may find so that's staggering, isn't it? We have to look at it like that. Where are we going? What about young India? You know, we are a young country in that sense because we have a huge population of young Indians. They determine our fate, everything. A little bit about the ICMR Young Diabetes Registry. Data not published yet. This is just registry data. So this is raw data. Uh, not published, just to give you a feel, and not, not like hardcore science. There are, this is a hospital-based registry. Right? This is not community data. These are people who are presented as patients to different hospitals. I'm just looking at the Delhi Center, because we are part of it. The coordinating center is at Ames, uh, run by Dr. Nikhil Tandon, who was also part of the CAR study. Dr. Mohan and Dr. Nikhil Tandon were the key investigators in that. So this ICMR Young Diabetes Registry is run by that, and Medanta is the largest contributor, contributor of patients. We have the largest number of young diabetics in this, in, this, uh, uh, in this registry. So the important point here is that even here, young diabetes means those who had an onset below 25. So out of that, 9% were type 2s. Like, OK, we think of young diabetes as type 1s. 9% as type 2, right? Which is, not, which is OK, which is surprising, but won't really be surprising if you look at, OK, first I'll explain this. Of course, type 2 diabetes occurs more in affluent population, more in people you know, who are physically inactive. Diets are not OK. So if you look at public hospitals, the type 2 is very low. If you look at the AIMS data, for example, their type 2s in young are very low. If you look at our data, they are, they are, they are fairly high, 17%. Right? So that's the difference. And again, the same people, basically. Genes are the same. It's just how you're treating yourself. We won't go into, there is already in these young diabetics, young India we're talking about, okay? At least one complication, at least one comorbidity. Comorbidity means coexisting condition. So blood pressure, celiac disease, you know, whatever, cholesterol issues, that. And as I said, complications means eye, kidney, nerve, whatever. So already in young diabetics, you're finding this. But in two centers, and that's more important for this registry, in two centers, and they're not Delhi centers, but looking at, I think, Dibrugarh and Chennai, almost 40% of those who presented with diabetes with onset below 25 years were type 2. Now, there may be differences. The centers may have some bias, referral bias. You know, I'm not, this is not a community study. But the fact is that still you have large numbers 
of people. We never saw type 2 diabetes in the young. When I, I, I think Anup will bear me out. When we were residents, if you diagnosed type 2 diabetes in a 22-year-old, you'd probably fail in the exam. Dr. Makkar is also here. So you'd probably fail in the exam. But now it's not unusual for me in the OPD to see a type 2 diabetic 24-year-old walking in, 23-year-old newly diagnosed, which we have never seen before. Like never, 10 years, 15 years ago even, it was very unusual to see that. So in our own data of, of, of I, can, I, I can actually even leave this, this is our own young diabetics, uh, which we are currently treating at Medanta, this has not come out too well, but there are two parts to this figure, and I'll explain it briefly. The left three columns are of people whose age is less than 18. And this is 18 to 25. This is from the same registry data. So this is less than, when you look at less than 18, these purple bars are type 1s. So less than 18, dominant, obviously, type 1. But as you come to 18 to 25, the difference narrows. 26% of the diabetics that we are treating who had their onset between 18 and 25 are actually type 2s. So, you know, there are, there are issues there which cannot be ignored. We'll leave this. This is our own data of youth onset diabetes, but it's quite disturbing. Now, the last part of my talk, uh, very, very recent uh, analysis. Most of the stuff, uh, you know, uh, derived from Indian studies, some stuff derived from studies on migrants. But, so it's not just here. South Asians living, and this includes, again, I said, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. South Asians living in Europe have a two to four high risk, high risk of type 2 diabetes as compared to the native European population. Right? So, so we've seen what's happening in our country. We've seen how we are hurtling down the slope. But even Indians, you can't escape it. Even if you're running away to Europe, your risk of getting diabetes is two to four fold higher than the, the native European. Again, and the age of onset, as I said, age at onset seems to be younger, five to 10 years less. So I think this is, this is really, really, uh, again, something that was known, but it has not been discussed so well as uh, in this study, uh, this uh, review by Navid Sattar. Now, I think this is what uh, uh, Dr. Mishra was trying to show to you. This is, I don't know if this is, this will be easier. The, the, the green and the red lines at the top are Pakistani and Indians. And the blue line, the blue curve, that is Europeans. Okay? And this is the body mass index, men and women. You can see any one. See the right one. See the men one. Okay? See just the right part. And you can see the, the, as the body weight is increasing from left to right, diabetes is going up in everybody. But look at the difference in the slope. With little increase in body weight, South Asians' diabetes really goes up. So with the, for the same body weight, it's going up like this for, 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 for Europeans and that steeply for Indians. You can see the difference there, this and that. So the blue lines, while as body weight is increasing, BMI is increasing, Europeans' diabetes is increasing, Indians' diabetes is increasing, but the Indians' diabetes is going up much faster. So I think that's also not very good news. I think we can, we can leave that. I think we leave that. This, this is just okay. I'll just tell you what it says without you don't have to focus on the slide too much. This is showing again what I was saying. Progression from pre-diabetes to diabetes is more rapid. So you're getting more diabetes, you're getting more uh, earlier onset, and you're progressing from pre-diabetes to diabetes uh, at, at a faster rate. So it's not even that you can ignore pre-diabetes and say, yeah, you know, they may or may not, very likely at some point they will, they will get uh, diabetes also. So this is the other point. This is a famous slide which at least all the doctors here would have seen a million times perhaps. But the idea is uh, this is another uh, major, major worker in the field of diabetes, uh, uh, Dr. Yagnik from Pune, who has made significant contributions to our understanding. And if you look at this, you find in the... These people, Dr. Yagnik being so thin versus Dr. Yudkin, who he was working with in the same lab. Uh, but Yagnik's body fat was 21%. Lean Indian, thin Indian, body weight I think was 60, 62 kilograms. 
whereas Dr. Yudkin, who was much bigger, had a body fat of 9.1%. So the lean obese Indian, which Anoop has so nicely shown in his earlier studies, that the lean obese Indian is, is a reality we have to accept. And this slide, a little bit cluttered, but I think it's worth spending just a minute on. Again, taken from, uh, from Dr. Sattar's recent review, because I thought it put everything together. Look at the left of this slide, to the left. The first factor there says genetic factors, right? Genetic factors, unclear. Yes, probably, but are we genetically more prone to diabetes? I don't think anyone can give a 100% answer to that. Maybe, maybe not, but there's no proof that genetically we are more prone to diabetes. Maybe we are, but you know, we don't know. Fetal programming, what is the story of fetal programming? Without going into too much detail, the, uh, the womb environment, the environment in the mother's womb is pretty important for future development of metabolic disorders. So if the mother is malnourished or is obese, both extremes, the fetus is programmed in different ways. I will not go into the whole concept, but the idea is that if you're programmed for malnutrition when in your mother's womb, and then you're exposed to these excess calories which are all around you at 8 years, 10 years, 12 years of age, you will quickly become obese and you will quickly become metabolically deranged. So this programming starts not just for children, but starts in the mother's womb. So that is very important. So that's where, so proper nutrition, neither under nor over, is, is important. So that's a part of, should be a part of maternal health programs. So it's not just obese women who give rise to obese kids who develop diabetes. It's undernourished women also because of the environment that the fetus is in that leads to the fetus programmed in, being programmed in a different way. The third is epigenetic factors. Again, all the, all the usual epigenetic factors and lifestyle factors. So all these factors are really, really important in our risk for diabetes. Let's just look at the brown ones here, which are the more proven ones. That's why they are darker. Higher percentage of body fat is clearly one of the reasons. Lower percentage of lean mass. Anup showed you those pictures of almost, I can stretch my neck and say, Indians are sarcopenic to some extent, as compared to standard populations, Western populations. Our muscle mass is clearly low, and our body fat proportion is clearly high. Uh, and of course, there are other things. Uh, we, we'll, we'll, we won't go too much into that. There's also some data now to suggest that even our beta cells may not be functioning that well, but, but I think we'll leave that for the moment. And therefore, there's increased insulin resistance and lifelong compensatory hyperinsulinemia. You know, if there's increased insulin resistance, you have more body fat, less muscle. You are not metabolizing properly. You get high levels of insulin, and therefore, you know, this whole process starts. Ultimately, the beta cells fail, and you get diabetes. So while insulin resistance or our higher body fat or lower physical activity or lower uh, body muscle develops, promotes insulin resistance and we become pre-diabetic and whatever, ultimately when the beta cells start failing, we become frankly diabetic. That's how it works. So the last point here is just one minute on gestational diabetes. Again, we're talking of young diabetics. Another area in India which is huge. And we need to be aware because we're talking of social aspects. Pregnancy and diabetes uh, is, is big here in the sense as the incidence of type 2 diabetes increases, gestational diabetes also increases. And different studies, there are some recent studies showing 15, 20% of pregnant women, but definitely above 10% of pregnant women have some diabetes during pregnancy, which will impact the mother, of course, but it will impact the baby not the, just the acute outcomes, of the immediate outcomes, but the long-term outcomes of the baby. The children born to mothers with gestational diabetes or diabetes in pregnancy are, are metabolically worse. They, they will tend to be more obese, get more diabetes, and all those kind of things. So I think we recently wrote on this, uh, comparing all kinds of data. There are some controversies about diagnostic technique. We won't go into all that, but the fact is, that whichever criteria you use, India has a very high and increasing prevalence of gestational diabetes. So our mothers, they may be malnourished otherwise, but they may be getting diabetes on the other hand. So it's, it's all becoming a, quite a conundrum. We did a social campaign on pregnancy and diabetes across four states some time back, which was 
largely aimed at creating awareness at the community level, targeted awareness in education of future mothers. And we talked to girls in their schools and advocacy with government and other uh, forums. These are some pictures of, um, of this program, which was in, in, in Jharkhand, in, in Bihar, in Delhi, and in uh, Punjab. And uh, we've had this outreach campaign. And very importantly, uh, straight to the village, not only that, in children's, in girls' schools, educating them. Because if you educate a girl, there's so many things you're educating at the same time. So this was a fairly success, successful campaign and all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, and this is where it concluded with, with uh, the uh, minister releasing the report of the impact of the campaign. So lots of things are required in India to be done about diabetes. I just gave you a few glimpses. But the fact is numbers are staggering. The approaches we can have can be upstream or downstream, meaning either we, the only thing that's going to work in the long term, if you start right at the, at the, at, at the root, if you start with good nutrition, good lifestyle, which is very hard to do, that's one end we need to work at. The other extreme is, is, is what was referred to as proper treatment, cheap treatment, Rational use of drugs, that's a big challenge. Rational use of tests, you know, just giving the cheap, like metformin, glimepiride type of drugs would, would suffice for a large proportion of our population. So we need to be rational in our drug usage. Yes, we need all the fancy new drugs for the kind of patients we sometimes see, but we don't need them for everybody. So the cost can be kept down. Cheaper glucose testing strips. I don't know what happened. Maybe Anoop knows to the ICMR. Maybe Makkar knows. Anybody knows to the ICMR two rupee strip. You know, for, for glucose testing. Those things will have an impact. So we need to look at care in that sense, making it affordable, accessible, awareness, education. We need to look at, look at strategies to improve nutrition and awareness for a different level to prevent diabetes. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can divide this. You can. Easier. We can stand here. We can take uh, questions uh, happily, uh, both for the first, second talk, or mixed, or whatever. Doesn't matter. Remember, there will be many interactive sessions subsequently. Yes. So you can pose the questions respective to the talks that we had. There was some, uh, an article, on, I think, in the Times of India two days ago about the three subtypes of uh, diabetes which will kind of, uh, can tell you what kind of uh, complication you will be having. Any, any, can you throw some light on that, please? The subtype of diabetes? Yes. With, with it, it came out in the Times of India, I think, uh, saying that, you know, one subtype A will be more predisposed to cardiovascular complications, subtype 2 will be more to renal, and the third one will be cancer and uh, nephrology. I mean... Uh, so you choose answer that. Is, is there something like that? Because I'm not very sure so about I it. We have an expert on subtypes here, right <laughs> here. Sujit. Okay. Yeah, I think we should be, uh, we can't oversimplify these things. Uh, I think we need a holistic approach. Uh, I don't think anyone is absolutely clear, but obviously there are kinds of patients who are at high cardiac risk, who have other associated conditions. They will go for, for, for often for cardiac events and cardiac problems. And there are others who are, who are really just running on high blood glucose without being obese, without having other cardiac risks, and they may end up more with renal complications. But that's really very soft. What I'm saying is not like really solid data. So I would say that all diabetics are prone to all complications. Uh, let, me, let me go further a bit. Uh, a good clinician should be able to evaluate what a phenotype of diabetes yeah. is. So if a person comes to me or Ambrish or Sujit, in five minutes, we should be able to make up a mind, this guy is not the usual type of diabetes. We will be uh, covered with one tablet. No. He may require extremely intensive lifestyle measures plus multiple drugs to keep not only sugar down but complications down. It will depend on several things including some of which, which I showed you. For example, let's say a person comes with a 22 centimeters liver which is full of fat and grade 3 fatty liver. This guy is going to be difficult. And we know by putting the hand that this is the problem. And 
that this guy not only will, will have a difficulty in getting the blood sugar control, but also will have a higher cardiovascular co complication. Uh, but sometimes we are not able to judge in around 10% or so. Those are people who are so-called hidden in somewhere between. They're not obese. They don't have family history. Yet they come when diagnosed with complications. These are the people who may have clear genetic basis. Uh, some mutations occurred. Some metabolic problem has occurred, which is not there in the family, which is not due to obesity and things like that, and yet they will develop. Those are difficult to identify, and we keep on seeing such patients every day. So I'll make one more point, Manju, and I think that is don't fall for these predictions. Somebody will do it by a hand sweat, somebody will do it by this, somebody will do it by that. There is no good way. These are all scores which are often not even validated properly. So I will stick my neck out again and say that this is all uh, hocus pocus. There's nothing in this. Yeah, that, I totally agree with uh, uh, Ambrish. There are many hocus pocus things going on uh, as far as diabetes. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a in thing, you know. Diabetes, you bandwagon of diabetes going fast. You have to have a hitch. Some people want to have a hitch ride on that. And so-called risk prediction is nothing. I can predict just by looking at yeah, you. Yeah, it's better. Awesome. Then the risk prediction will take 1,000 or 2,000, whatever. I don't know what is the price uh, of your money. And confuse you further. And similarly, uh, I don't know whether Ambrish or Sujit will agree with me or not. There are some predictors, on the genetic predictors going on. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they confuse you. So they will say, well, you have 10% apart from diabetes risk, 10% breast cancer risk. Now you are you're totally worried. <laughs> will I go Angela Jolie way or some other way? Things like so, you you need to be very clear that you know most of these things do not surpass the usual clinical examination and some simple biochemical chemical test. Don't aspire. Nothing has surpassed till now. So, if that answers your question, okay. Hey, Suji. If you are health minister today, what two things you would do to prevent diabetes in India? I think both of you. I think I, I, think I already said that what I would do, and Anup can add in a few. Uh, I, I said we need two approaches. We need a long-term sustained approach for prevention, nutrition, which should be done in any case. right? We need availability of healthy food. You see, I did a program on some television channel, and these Khalsa College boys were there. And we kept saying, don't do this, don't do this. They said, where should we eat healthy food? How do, it's not available in our university. It's not available in our college. There's a lot of campaign for that. So one is that, that whole change of environment or obesogenic environment, somebody calls it, diabetogenic environment. That is a big challenge, not easy, but can be done. At least steps can be taken. That is one end of the spectrum. The other end is to, to really have easy access to care. More physicians trained in treating diabetes. Better access to care. I think, I think even even uh, nutritionists, educators, better equipped to handle the large numbers that are required. Not everyone can reach a doctor all the time. Cheaper drugs, cheaper testing. So it's not that you have to make every drug cheap. See, the, when you talk of cheaper drugs, people only talk of the new drugs that are coming in, 50 rupees a tablet, they should be priced lower. How many people need those drugs? If you just have access to quality drugs, metformin, sulfonylureas, those kind of drugs, at a reasonable cost, cheap cost, it will make a huge difference, huge difference. I think that's where, so two ends of the spectrum need to be addressed. I'll add, first of all, uh, how much money are you giving me? <laughs> 100 crores? 200 crores? <laughs> uh, 1,000 crores? <laughs> okay, let's keep it 100 crores. <laughs> huh? Out of 100 crores, I will spend, give me 24 hours as health minister, I will spend 70 crores on only, you know, like a pulse polio type of program or, uh, you know, HIV type of program, I will spend on 70 crore. 10 crore, I'll do what you are going to discuss. High risk screening. And 20 crore, I'll develop all these people into a semi doctors. Yeah. You don't, you know, people don't need, need me or Ambrish or you. They need a good general practitioner yeah. who is aware of treating 80% of the diabetic patient. 20% they can refer to me and we'll treat it. But 80% should be treated by a general practitioner and treated well. So they should know how to start a drug, what to do as far as blood pressure concern, how to prevent heart disease and things like that. If they have that, those basics, 80%, I will put 20 crores on that. 
and resource development of uh, you know nutritionist and so on if that is done in next 5 years i can tell you this huge you know curve that a bridge it is like a rising tide this is not stopping it is not even uh, going like this plateauing it is going up like this where will it end i don't know so that may be curved then and second give me another 100 crores to put on the schools 200 crores <laughs> so just to, just to peel out of his uh, question only and what you had mentioned uh, when you say that uh, we indians uh, we are uh, generally uh, obese and lean frame when we know that why not uh, having a program like when you have indra dhanush or you have polio where you are stressing on ye saat injection lene zaruri hai so after some time when you uh, when indians are more prone at a particular age uh, diagnosis should be a must Uh, something like that is there kind of awareness created among the people of so program by the government or by the private institutions or by if i i'm not right now diabetic but i if i go, come to you uh, am i even suggested by the doctors ki aap ye test zarur karwa lo something like that it's a very very important question which age we should intervene actually and which age we should uh, we should prep, uh, you know impart awareness and knowledge and change their attitudes you know my attitude is fixed you want uh, me to eat one roti i will not eat i will still eat it through three rotis which i have been eating for last 20 years very difficult to change then so when do we change and this we have clearly shown in a, one of our publication in british journal of nutrition when we did the school program he said we, the children who are between 8 to 11 years of age when do we impart them education their knowledge goes goes like this their attitude changes like this when we do that 15 years to 18 years the knowledge goes like this because they already know and their ideas are fixed and their attitude do, doesn't change so we start early and recently i was there in the health ministry uh, chaired by the health secretary uh, adolescent program which uh, uh, indian government is developing at uh, this uh, uh, they are looking at this alone so we we were discussing whether we should do all the schools community what i said no put all the money that's why i have, i ask sujit for 100 crores for schools only 100 crores or more on the schools if we change there from the early onward the second thing which we we showed in our research study that metabolism which goes haywire is between 15 to 21 years of age so we are looking at 8 to 11 or 12 or 13 where we should impart full education intensive and we should have proper school programs for that like any of the intensive programs you have mentioned change their knowledge change their attitude so that that 15 to 21 years increase in the triglyceride low hdl and beginning of glucose this metabolism can be it is not easy it's not never going to be easy because what you know you also may know that and i also may know that we have to exercise 60 minutes per day but we may not do so so changing knowledge and attitude doesn't mean that they will practice it but at least we should try sir i want to include a health science booklet in the school going children yeah, yeah. that's the simplest way and i suggested i was one of the part in the gujarat government we just talked about that why not to include in education minister as well as if health minister like what he asked if you become the health minister what will be the, so one of the best way happened, yeah. the health science booklet that can be added when the child is up to the age of 8 and then when he is growing in that age so everything remaining i mean not only non communicable disease obesity nutrition all aspects will be taught to him till he passes his 11 to 12 that's one the second is the promotion of the child i mean from f- second or fourth standard to fifth standard or fifth to sixth normally school gives the marks only on his academic basis it should be also on his health basis on his because pediatric obesity which is increasing like anything if 25% of that mark system is given only on the basis of that the parents will be behind the child that he should not become obese he should be healthy he should be sporty like all these should be also the part of that is the way of the prevention as we have young india and young indians which are going to become in the what we are seeing what amrish had shown just before some time at the age of 35 we are seeing the you know number of persons becoming diabetic so prevention cannot be done at the age of 25 or 30 if prevention is to be done it has to be done in teenagers or before that so just just very nice uh, bansi two comments one is that uh, as an aside i'll tell you that uh, up government has introduced a health education booklet 
uh, which has been prepared by one of our former colleagues uh, uh, from the Hope Foundation, uh, Dr. Gaur Chaudhary, a gastroenterologist actually with Fortis now, uh, who uh, that has been introduced uh, just this month. It is not a mandatory subject, but that booklet is given to everybody, and it's like moral science was taught in school like an, like an optional. It is there. So, I mean, those kind of things people are thinking of. The second is I'm not so sure whether uh, uh, whether penalizing or pushing kids in that direction, it will maybe only add to their stress, but we can discuss those things as different uh, techniques. I think uh, along with all this, what I emphasized was that maternal nutrition is exceedingly important. And we have a very, uh, we have a strong maternal um, uh, mother and child program, you know. So the mother and child program needs to be strengthened to look at this also. And really, if, if maternal nutrition, we start there, and then the second, group when we are influencing behavior is 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 an early adult just pre-adolescent and then you know so we are so i think if we, we need a multi-pronged strategy at different levels who should be tested and who should be screened which is what the original question was i think will be addressed in the panel yeah actually good to hear you uh, you have a finger at every lifestyle <laughs> life's uh, you know span of prevention i know that you have done wonderful job now uh, the 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 thing is that I'll give you two examples. One is uh, just 10 days back that meeting again, we have uh, looked at NCRT uh, health education ministry coming along with health ministry uh, and looking at the, at the revised chapters and every chapter at different classes, different chapters at different classes. Uh, the, so that is being thought of how much it is feasible, how much time it will take, I don't know. The second thing is there is a, a, a person who approached us uh, just 10 days back again who is in the United States who has plenty of money. He says, I want to change uh, lives of children in, in India. He is Indian. So I said, yes, go ahead, uh, tell me what you want to say. I have approached, he says, I have approached NCRT 10 times, met the director and say, you want money, you want this thing, I am willing to get expert, everybody write a booklet give it to you, you do whatever, say, don't talk to me on this, I can never do it, NCRT director says, or their team says. You want to distribute, do it, do it yourself. Currently, whatever the course is, we will not alter. This is the so sort of approach at this point uh, people have, NCRT people who are going to change. So it is very difficult, and we have been talking about, uh, Banshi, you and I have been talking about for five years on this uh, issue, and nothing has changed till now. First, we have to get the uh, doctor's thing out of NCRT books, <laughs> which is bad-mouthing doctors <laughs> with the cartoon and everything. Last, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, sir, I have one question. <coughs> sir, diabetes has always featured in the medical textbooks in the under medicine or maybe in preventive uh, medicine under non-communicable disease. But one slide you showed where you said weight reduction surgery or bariatric surgery reverses diabetes mellitus. So do we see that a shift of treatment from medical to surgical, the future of diabetes? Because I am from insurance field and sir, we have few policies wherein we encourage bariatric and we have introduced bariatric and weight reduction surgeries as part of the policies. Let me tell you this. Uh, I wrote two editorials on one of the longest prevention trials in the world. One five years back when the trial was 10 years old and one now when trial is 15 years old. And in first one, when I wrote nothing else but diet and exercise, what they shown is correct and you may change the type of exercise, you may change a bit of diet, drugs only come second. I get an angry letter from a chief of surgery from one of the New York hospitals. He said, what trash you have written. You have not even mentioned one word about bariatric surgery as a prevention. I said, this is not prevention at the moment. That was five years back. This time, I, fearing that such attack may come again, I put one line in the editorial, but that doesn't mean that we are going to apply that in the, in the population-wide. That's a, a case-wise, individual-wise. Population-wide, the strategies remain the same, that your diet has to be correct, your exercise has to be correct, and in some cases, we have to give drugs to prevent diabetes, what Ambrish was talking about, pre-diabetes. So at that stage, we, give, we do intensive lifestyle modification and drugs if possible. Bariatric surgery is only in very obese people at that stage, but it has potential of prevention or reversal of diabetes. I hope that answers. But since you're from the insurance, I yes, think sir. that's another big area. Yeah. 
where one could do something. If you're talking of nutrition, awareness, maternal health, treatment availability, I think it's really funny. This is the only country in the world where insurance covers complications but not chronic care. So it's okay if you get a transplant because of your diabetes, kidney transplant, but it's not okay to get reimbursed for your insulin till you have that stage, till you're at that stage. It's very strange. So I think people have to join hands. There are South African models, for example, of insurance, which give incentives to people based on their A1C, LDL, and, and, and uh, you know, discounts on their premiums. So what I'm saying is that that also is an area which discourages chronic care, discourages people from seeking care, the economics. And if we can have, uh, I have, I treat, I think not a small number of patients. I don't think I have treated anybody who has private insurance for, I mean, I'm not talking of company insurance or Sarkari insurance. I'm talking of actual purchase. I don't remember treating anybody. Has anybody treated people like that? Yeah, yeah. So, so all kind. Of, so we're not going too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. So we'll. I mean, that's so nearly your last point, and then we end this because uh, I think we're horribly. <laughs> my suggestion to the both the health ministers, maybe on the different time, is that some change in the medical curriculum need to be done. Uh, diabetes and chronic care should be given a weightage in the medical curriculum. Many of us who have been through uh, the uh, our MBBS and MD. The Hutchison textbook mention a one or two pages in the endocrine and diabetes. Then they change the endocrine and diabetes section become bigger, bigger, and of late they have come with a full, complete, dedicated section on the diabetes. In our MBBS examination, there is no dedicated hmm. case for diabetes. And even during the MD, you need not to know nothing about diabetes if the uh, uh, student is posted with somebody interested in the respiratory disease probably he may not have treated diabetes. So the change in the medical curriculum has to be done and chronic case, because we are in a uh, case, uh, stage of the epidemiological transition where we have not wiped out the uh, acute disorders, even the chronic disorders have going up. So that will be my suggestion. Yeah. Uh, absolutely yeah. correct. Uh, you know, the, there is a uh, diabetes increasingly has become important, so more weightage has to be given. Well, for me, I was lucky because I was taught by one of the best diabetologist in the world at that time, Professor J.S. Bajaj. So everything was diabetes then <laughs> at that time, whatever be the curriculum. But a curriculum has expanded also and uh, of course if you see the medical ward these days, 50% of yeah, the yeah. patients are diabetic. So you, can avoid, you cannot avoid it's diabetes at any time mm -hmm. and bedside teaching, every second patient you will get diabetic. So you will anyway get, get more exposure to diabetes. Uh, Amrish, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we need to make way for the, we really messed up the timing here. Yeah, with that, uh, we once again thank uh, Dr. Mishra, thanking uh, Dr. Mithal. And may I request uh, Sandhya to kindly present uh, a small token of thanks and regards and gratitude to both of you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are uh, almost running one hour late. So <laughs> we will have to just catch on the time as we move into the next session. Thank you uh, so much, uh, sir. Thank you. Dr. Ambrish Mithil, thank you, sir. And a thanks also to Dr. Anup Mishra.